Oh, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton, and I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. Flying solo for this episode. Cousin Shane needed the day off. We've been riding him hard on the show, so he deserves a day off. But don't worry, we've got uh, an absolutely loaded show. We had so much content, couldn't even fit it all on this episode. We're going to sh- save some of it. For I think what I'm going to do is just wake up Friday, work on a show, get it out as soon as I can to get a little bonus material heading into the weekend. There is just so much going on. But for this one, we got updates from Auburn, Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, South Carolina, and Ole Miss. So without further ado, let's get to uh, what was potentially the biggest story here in the SEC on Thursday. Some bad news. Oh, TJ Finley vying for the uh, starting quarterback job down there in Auburn. Of course, it looked like he was behind Zach Calzada entering fall camp, arrested down there in Auburn. And and this was right after TJ Finley became the first athlete to sign a deal with Amazon, some kind of Amazon NIL deal. I didn't read too much into it, but apparently, you know, a pretty big deal. They were going to sell stuff, I think, on the Amazon marketplace. Well, hey, I hope it still works out for him, but I, I don't know if there's a you know a clause where you got to not be arrested. And there was speculation that old TJ Finley was going around on a moped, but the Auburn police said it was actually a motorcycle got arrested for eluding the Auburn PD down there and I guess breaking some traffic laws. Nothing too serious, but it's just, it's comical that uh, it doesn't matter What year, you know, you think the athletes getting paid now, you got to be a little bit more professional. Uh Uh-uh. They're on their motorcycles, mopeds, whatever the hell he was on, doing crazy stuff. And he did turn himself in. So it's not like he was evading police for that long. I guess as as soon as they put out a warrant for him, he turned himself in. But still, not (laughs) what Brian Arson and company wanted to have to deal with day one of Auburn football camp. We'll get to more Auburn stuff on the next episode but it's kind of hard to see tj finley starting basically is the is the moral of the story if you get arrested day one of camp so zach calzon if he wasn't already the front runner to win that job he may have locked it up without even actually doing anything this training camp but speaking of auburn let's kick it over to their sec east rivals the georgia bulldogs reigning national champions of course and hey you know, something we hit on during the, the media days. Georgia, maybe they are being a little slept on. I thought that was kind of silly. Georgia's a preseason top five. I know the polls are not officially out yet, but I guarantee you when they do come out, Georgia's going to be sitting there. People doubting Stetson Bennett, myself included. Maybe Georgia is getting slept on here. And there are, you know, despite the fact that uh, people like Brett Sianca pick six previews, they, he's got Georgia Bulldogs. In the college football playoff, go back and check it out if you miss it on our last episode. You know, starting to hear more buzz about Georgia, getting inside info as the Bulldogs hit the practice field for the first time this week down there in Athens looking to defend their national title. But again, not SEC champions. That was Alabama. We'll get to Alabama in a minute. But Georgia, a lot of pressure to repeat as a national champion. And they've got the roster to do it. But there are question marks to address on this team, specifically thinking about a defensive back. I don't know if anyone's going to have time to throw on the Georgia Bulldogs because their front seven is going to be so nasty. But if you do have time, that's secondary. That is going to be where you're going to be able to attack the Georgia Bulldogs. That is, uh, you know, there is, I don't want to go as far as say a flaw in this defensive system. You, You essentially need an elite quarterback and some elite receivers to push the ball down the field. That's how you beat this, uh, Nick Saban, Kirby Smart defense, and that may may be the case this season, given the uh, uncertainty that Georgia has in its defensive backfield outside of guys like Kaylee Ringo, who is, of of course, the hero of the national championship game. But who will start opposite Ringo? That's a big question mark that's got to be figured out here. And two names I'm hearing, Kamari Lasseter, freshman Dalen Everett. Those are the guys to watch, going to be – a really heated battle to watch down there in Athens opposite who, who's going to earn that starting role in the secondary. And our man, Rusty Manziel, no one's got 
a better pulse on that Georgia football program than Rusty. He had this to say on Thursday morning. I thought it was interesting with the Georgia camp starting. I usually give a name to know ahead of time. I'll give you two. Michael Williams, the number four overall recruit in the country on the defensive line, and that Dalen Everett at corner from IMG Academy, I believe. So here we got Georgia. Again, they're going to need players to step up. And why not a couple of five stars they got here ready to it going into their first training camp in Athens. It's going to be pretty interesting to see what comes of that. And that is, of course, when I talk about the secondary, Tyke Smith coming back from an ACL. His status kind of, you know, he, he hasn't made that impact we all thought he would after coming in from West Virginia as an All-American. But, of course, he got injured. So that's the main reason why. How fast can he rehab that injured ACL. So uh, let's kick it over to Kirby Smart. He talks about uh, the the status of Tyke Smith and Tate Ratledge on the offensive line, someone that Georgia would love to have at full strength after his season, unfortunately, was ended last season due to injury. A little update here from old Kirby Smart. Uh, media days, you mentioned Tyke wasn't quite uh, cleared for football. Has anything changed just in the last few weeks? Tyke's uh, out there repping, doing things. I wouldn't say he's 100%, um, but he's, he's he's doing everything we've asked him to do and um, may not be completely clear for live tackle just yet. That'll be up to Ron and, and how comfortable he feels with or without his brace. It's gaining confidence in those things. But he's, he's doing all the drills without limitation, but with every ACL – just because you're doing it without limitation doesn't put you where you were. You have to gain confidence in that. You have to uh, get back in playing shape. It's just different. Kirby, can you update us on Tate Ratledge and the inside linebackers? Tate uh, has been great. He's uh, worked really hard at his conditioning. Uh, Ron feels like um, he's in a position where what we did summer training would have been tougher on him coming off the injury than actual football practice. So the, the football practice piece should relieve uh, some of that. Now, the strain and effort to push off and double teams as we put on pads may increase that, but he's in a good spot. Uh, he's been rotating in with uh, the first group and the second group. Uh, I do think there is a matter of coming back where you haven't you know, passed off a twist, you haven't passed off a stunt, and there's some quick back guys inside that he's going to take some some reps to get that back. But certainly feel good about where he is and his toughness. Now, one other name that's getting a lot of buzz down there. I mean, my goodness, they're so loaded down there. I, not a lot of these guys have uh, starting experience, but they have playing experience. Smile Munden, the linebacker, former, again, <laughs> it's going to sound familiar, former five-star down there that uh, is ready to, to potentially crack the starting lineup. Kirby Smart also gave Smile Munden some praise here as fall camp underway in Athens. Yeah, excited about the guys we have at inside backer. You know, I mean, that, that, those guys were – I was excited about those guys last year. They didn't get an opportunity to uh, flash and show their talents because of the three guys we had. But, you know, uh, Smile Munden is as good an athlete as I've seen. He has to increase his physicality, his toughness. Um, he missed spring. Um, because of a, a shoulder surgery, but he's put on some good solid weight. He's a really good athlete. He played a lot of snaps on special teams. Pop played a lot of snaps on special teams. Core linebackers get valuable experience on special teams before they're the feature guy. So both those two guys got a lot of experience. Sorry's come a long way. Now, I think the biggest thing Kirby had to say right out the gate here, the question that I have all offseason for the Georgia Bulldogs, complacency. Will that set in? Not, I'm not worried about Kirby Smart. I know enough about that man to know he was locked in on this season immediately after the national championship game. But it's the players. They need leadership to step up. We know they got Nolan Smith. We know they got Stetson Bennett. They got guys like that. They do have leaders ready to step up. But there is certainly going to be a void compared to last season's all-time roster Will complacency be an issue? Kirby doesn't think so. And I thought this was also kind of interesting. The plan for training camp. They've obviously been wildly successful down there in Athens. Will anything change? Kirby says, you got to change the plan for camp based on your roster year to year. And I, I think this is smart. Even though he's had, they've had wild success, he's adjusting to the team that he's got now. And I think a lot of smart coaches are unwilling or unable to do this. Kirby, you've talked about not being too worried about complacency. Uh, that's obviously something a lot of coaches worry about coming off a championship. Why is that not a concern for you, and or has it seemed to be a concern? And I'll, 
And do you uh, have you done anything different to try to make kind of guard against it? I I don't worry about it because you don't <laughs> we don't have a reason to be complacent. I mean, I've been on national championship teams that won it all that I was concerned about complacency because there's a lot of back. We don't really have that problem. So it's not a problem inherent to us in terms of complacency. Okay, I, I worry about complacency every year for a guy that started and played for two years, but that was regardless of the record. Like, it didn't matter if you won eight games, 10 games, 12 games, or 15 games. You worry about a guy being comfortable that has started multiple years and Kenny grows. So a lot of that's intrinsic within him of how good does he want to be? How great does he want to be? Does he want to continue to grow, develop? Does he want to improve his opportunity for the NFL? Does he want to be the best he can possibly be? Because I know the guys who haven't played are hungry. We have to keep the guys who have hungry. It has nothing to do with complacency. It's not that whether we win or lose every game this year, it's not going to be because of complacency. It's going to be because of the outcomes and what we did on the grass to make that possible. But it won't be because of complacency. And do you try to tweak, uh, you know, year after year now that you're the head coach, what, what, it, uh, what it looks like? Or is it pretty much the same uh, plan um, year after year? No, it's changed every year. Uh, I think you change your plan based on your team. You know, we had a different team last year than we had this year. We, yesterday was our first report day, and it looked a little different than what, uh, than what it was last year. Now, to the eye, to your guys, probably wouldn't be any different, but it's different to us because we have different stages. You know, we're, we're younger in some spots. We need more of this, less of this, more lifting, less of that, more walk. I mean, there's different things we tweak, but I certainly start with the same foundation of – uh, these are the days we're going to work. This is the schedule we're going to keep, but trying to make it work better. Now, speaking of uh, having an elite team, let's kick it all down to Tuscaloosa, where Alabama started camp here on Thursday as well. And Nick Saban, I mean, my God, social media was a buzz here. I believe this was on Wednesday. He was on a uh, – I think it was on, down on jocks, Cole Kublick and, and Greg McElroy's show when he said last year – was a rebuilding year for us. And, of course, he's talking they finished national runner-up. They won the SEC. They did lose two games, though, and we certainly know that's not the standard down there in Tuscaloosa. So uh, let's kick it over to Nick Saban on what exactly he was talking about and the mindset of this team heading into the season. We've all heard the revenge factor. It seems like Nick Saban's pretty pissed off here, ready to go day one of fall camp. A lot was made about your comments yesterday about the, two, the 21 team being uh, a rebuilding year. What is your response to that? and how do you? Well, I, I don't understand what's so hard to understand when the point being we were young and we should have nine starters back on offense and nine starters back on defense. That's the point I was trying to make. Six guys went out for the draft. So as we usually have to do, we have lots of rebuilding to do again this season. So that's the point that I was trying to make. So when you have a lot of young players playing, I don't think our standard is like everybody else's standard, but when you have a lot of young players playing, you're actually trying to rebuild so those guys get the kind of experience you need so they can play at the level you need them to play at so you can play to the standard you want to play to. Hey, Coach. So talking about the mindset, I know that the hunger for this team after losing in the national championship has been on their mind this entire offseason. I want to know from your philosophy, you've been on both sides of that. When do you want players to turn and focus on the new season, or do you like that edge throughout the season to kind of have that in the back of their mind that they want to get back for that redemption? Well, I'd like for players to have that kind of edge for who they want to be, how they want to play, to be the best players that they can be, regardless of what happened last year, whether they won and had success like we did the year before, uh, whether we lost and you know, there's a little humiliation in terms of uh, pride in performance and not being able to finish the way we'd, we'd like, uh, losing the game in the fourth quarter. Uh, I think all those things are motivating factors for players. Now, you've heard me speak many, many times. People respond better when things don't go well. I like for players to respond well no matter how things go. When they go well, uh, they're kind of relentless uh, in, you know, continuing to try to improve, uh, not be satisfied, not be complacent, 
Uh, I think it's human nature sometimes to feel that way, but that's not something you can do if you really want to be successful and play at a high level on a consistent basis because hopefully we're going to be able to have success and players are going to have to be able to deal with that success and they're going to have to accept the challenge that we're going to play against a lot of good competition and everybody's going to try to give their best game when they play against us. So regardless of whether we're winning or losing, I want everybody to want to play to a standard. Uh, although I do acknowledge the fact that you know, when you lose, when bad things happen, from a human nature standpoint, people seem to respond a little bit better. Um, is that what we want? No, but I think that's probably something that is pretty normal for most of us human beings. So the Crimson Tide, no doubt, based on this, locked in. Again, Saban loves to use these as a, as a message to his team. We all know that. But one bit of bad news here, unfortunate, not sure Saban's kind of doesn't want to reveal too much about it, but starting tight end Cam Latu, fifth-year senior, team's leading returning receiver with 26 catches, 410 yards, and eight touchdowns. He's out, and we don't know how long, but uh, here's what Nick Saban had to say about it. He was asked about the injuries many times, would not reveal, any, reveal anything when he was asked specifically about Cam he gave a little bit of information, but it doesn't sound like his season's over, but sounds like he's going to be out a little while. And, and how confident are you in the depth you have after Cam Latou? Well, Cam is going to be missed sometime in camp. Uh, I don't know exactly how long, which is an opportunity. Uh, I think we have a couple, three freshmen, young guys that have an opportunity to develop. So it'll give them a lot of reps and a lot of opportunity in camp. So uh, that's a position that we definitely need to develop some depth at, and this will give us a good opportunity to do that. All right, next on the docket here, let's kick it on down to Lexington, where Mark Stoops opened the latest training camp there in Kentucky. No update on Chris Rodriguez. They're still ducking, dodging, diving that question. Didn't have anything to add at media days, not having anything to add here. So, Again, I haven't heard anything different than two-game suspension, which would mean he's out for the Florida game. I don't think that's final, though, because otherwise I think they'd kind of come out here and say, unless maybe they're just wanting Florida to prepare for Chris Rodriguez in, in anticipation of him being there. But Mark Stoops was asked about the confidence in that running back room if Chris Rodriguez is unable to go. And he didn't necessarily like shoot it down. If Chris Rodriguez was for sure going to play, I feel like Mark Stoops may not have addressed this. I don't. I don't know. I don't think he would have went into specifics like he did here. So here's what uh, Stoops had to say about uh, Chris Rodriguez to open camp. Mark, any update on Chris's status? Today? No, I really don't have any comment on on Chris's status at this point. Mark, you guys spend any time in the season without Chris? How do you feel about the rest of that position? The rest of we feel just fine about it. You know, we, we feel like there's some really solid players there that are, you know, have a chance to, to break out and do some really good things. And, you know, all, all those guys, Lavelle, Jaton, you know, Cavassier, Ramon, the new new transfer, Michael Drennan, I mean, all, all those guys we have confidence in. Now, even if you don't have Chris Rodriguez, you got a chance, a fighting chance down there in games because you got Will Levis and you got some experience. Now, offensive tackle, that's an issue. Both your tackles off to the NFL after last season's offensive line. That is going to be a situation of monitor. Stoop says they're thin on the offensive line, particularly uh, you know they're at offensive tackle. But the Wildcats do have a big time advantage by having Will Levis and the leadership he brings. He's been a leader since the moment he got there last summer. So let's kick it over to Mark Stoops talking about. The advantage having Will Levis on this roster gives the Kentucky Wildcats. Mark, are there expectations? I feel very good. I feel very good. Um, DeAndre has been very uh, steady there. You know, we have a great one, Keontae, uh, backing him up. Jeremy's done a really good job on the other side, along with David. You know, David Wollenbaugh has been uh, a pleasant surprise, you know, and, and doing a really, really good you know, solid job. So we are thin at the offensive line. Uh, Josh Jones is out as well. He he's uh, he's been off and on, you know, with injury his whole time here, really, and it's too bad for him. Uh, but he'll have a a procedure done where he he will be out for the year, and that he hasn't played much for us. But it, it's it's depth that we need at that position. So. We'll be 
Mark, with uh, you're talking about all the newcomers and people having to step up with you know with different positions. What does it mean to have somebody like Will with his leadership and experience from last year and just seeing what's going on? Well, that's you know it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it's you know he's a a great leader and um, starting with his own work ethic. You know, and our one of our first principles in, in leadership is is lead yourself, and he certainly does that well. And uh, then he has the impact to affect those close to him and then get to the point where he's at now with the confidence with the year under his belt, he affects the entire program and the culture of our program. And, and everything about him is authentic, you know, and that that's uh, really good to see. And I think any of us that have seen people that you could kind of see right through um, doesn't take long. And uh, you can't see through him. I mean, because he's he's real. How's he handling all the hype that's been going around him? I know you've had some high-level players before, but this no. preseason hype. I have no issues with that because he is very motivated. He's very driven. Uh, you know, just just in his his own ability. Now, South Carolina, they also opened camp here on Thursday. Shane Beamer met with the media. A little bit of injury news. Punter Kai Kroger injured. Doesn't sound like this is going to be any like a season-ending injury or anything, but. One thing to monitor, special teams, he's the holder, too, and he's an elite holder. He's saved him probably two games last year with bad snaps on game-winning field goal kicks. So, hey, this is uh, potentially normally you'd roll your eyes at a punter being injured. This could be uh, big news there in Columbia. They've got to monitor the situation. But the big thing being asked of, of Shane Beamer here, opening the gates, the offense, How's that unit coming together with Spencer Rattler and company, all these transfer receivers, transfer tight end, transfer running backs, a lot of moving pieces on that offense that at times last year was downright pathetic. But now that they got all these new pieces, continuity of the staff, everybody that's in year two should be on the same page. It's all about get working in these new pieces. They've got a month to do it. Let's kick it over to uh, Shane Beamer on the offense and also – very high on this offensive line, which returns five players with starting experience. They were a weakness last season. A lot of people thought that would be a strength, but it didn't turn out that way. Their offensive line coach, Greg Atkins, had some health issues. So putting that behind them, let's see how this offensive line performs in year two under Shane Beamer, Marcus Satterfield, and Greg Atkins. Shane, as far as the offense is concerned, obviously offensive coordinators coming back, so many new faces um, in the backfield, but you have a lot of familiar faces up front. How do you see this offense so far, the growth in comparison to the spring and just being able to pick things up? Because no disrespect to Georgia State, but from an SEC standpoint, very two good teams early on in the year and, you know, competition is going to be high. Yeah, no question. And a really talented uh, Georgia State defense in game one that returns a ton of starters and a bunch of juniors and seniors also, I know. Um, I think the biggest thing is just that, just the, the one, the continuity, year two in the system. Uh, as coaches, we've, you know, had the whole off season to kind of tweak and figure out things that we need to be, uh, uh, maybe do a little bit differently, at least schematically, things that we need to do differently, whatever it may be. Spent a lot of time studying that. And, and certainly when it's year two in a system, it's just going to be that much um, – uh, more efficient, you would hope. And that's what we've seen from the springtime through the summer workouts that our players have been able to do with what we've been able to do with them as a coaching staff within the rules this summer on the field. Also, uh, we're so much farther along than where we were and because there's just one so much retention and then, and then also trying to do a good job of what are we good at schematically and then let's rep the heck out of that as well. So it just becomes second nature for our guys. So I... Um, I would hope tomorrow morning it doesn't look like a typical day one practice where it's sloppy and a bunch of mistakes because we're pretty far along compared to uh, compared to last year because of those reasons. You've got a pretty unique thing here this year with five starters coming back on the offensive line. What kind of growth have you seen from that group through the spring and the summer heading into the camp now? Yeah, it's been a lot of growth. Uh, that's a great weapon for us coming back, having those guys returning. There are older guys that have played a lot of snaps, and when you have that continuity on the offensive line, it should pay dividends because they've. that's the one position. All five of those guys got to be working together and, and in sync with everything because one guy taking a bad step can screw it up for everyone. And those are guys that have played a lot of football together. They've spent a lot of time off the field together. They're older guys. They're leaders. You know, we, we I use Javon Gwynn for an example. We, we, we keep track of – everything that our players do so we just got done talking to the team about it you know this summer we keep track of 
uh, their accountability off the field? Are they in the building on time every day? Are they uh, uh, academic stuff? Uh, um, are they weighing in with Kristen and nutrition like they're supposed to? And then on the field, uh, are you making all of your runs when we're out there and we're timing our guys and we're competing? Do you do everything you're supposed to? We try and make some of those conditioning runs in the summertime as game-like as possible to see how guys can handle pressure and being able to think on the run. So it's very, very, very hard to do to go through an entire summer and not have a single strike on anything. And Javon Gwynn Gwyn did it this summer. I mean, it's amazing to be a lineman for one, because it's not always for those guys easy to run and make times like he if in if you can have the perfect summer, Javon Gwynn just had the perfect summer. And um, now we need along with some other guys on our team. But now we need him to continue to come along uh, as well, because what they've done from the time they came back in January until now is they've been great leaders for this team, and they're a hungry, driven group, ready to, ready to uh, to prove themselves this fall. Now, last thing here for the Gamecocks, I thought this was a great question. Maybe not worded the best, but a lot of hype around South Carolina. Those fans are on cloud nine. We've covered it at length on this show, but. Shane Beamer kind of pumps the brakes a little bit on that because, my God, the, the Gamecocks just got picked fifth in the SEC East by the media. Now, does that mean anything? Hell no. It doesn't mean anything. But the buzz in Columbia does not necessarily match the buzz around the SEC in that locker room. So, uh, you know, I thought this was an interesting question and a, and a really good response here from Shane Beamer on all the hype in Columbia heading into the season. You did that video before SEC Media Days. It had over 2 million views, and your social media folk have been very active in the offseason, pumping up the program. I think the fan base is foaming at the mouth this season. Um, is that a dangerous place to be as concerned, or is that uh, maybe more of a sign of confidence about this team that you internally kind of know what you're going to be putting on the field? Yeah, no, I think it's um, – I would rather have that than – None of our fans giving a crap that we're playing in four weeks or, or not excited um, and not being trending on Twitter and have millions of views and all that. I mean, I'd rather have that than the, than the alternative for sure. But it's also, um, it's also critical to understand, and we talked about this this morning too as a staff, and I'll talk about it with the team tonight, understanding that – the reason that all this is taking place is because of all the work that went into last year as well, along with what we've done up until this point as well. Like it's been a grind and there's a lot, a lot of work that has taken place by the individuals in this program uh, to get to that point as well. So, you know, there's a lot that we, you can look back at from last season, Phil, that we got to do a whole lot better. And uh, there's, a lot. Now we did some really good things last year. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot to improve on, and that'll be that has been made clear, and will continue to get made clear to our pro to our players and staff as well. Like well, I'm happy with where we are right now, but you know nobody's walking around saying, "Hey man, we got picked fifth in the SEC East, fellas, freaking go!" All right, or "Hey guys, there's nobody on our team made first team All SEC." Like there's plenty of bulletin board and and motivation that I can use as well because we're not where we need to be right now but we're certainly on our way now last team we're going to hit on on the show let's kick it on down to oxford where old miss open training camp there year three under the lane train just coming off a 10 win season sugar bowl performance but a lot of unanswered questions here and it starts with quarterback right out the gate <laughs> lane giffen asked about the quarterback competition said they're not going to rush it He's done that before, and it proved to be a mistake on the field. So let's kick it over to Lane Kiffin. Shares the latest on the Luke Altmeyer Jackson Dart, how that thing is shaping up, heading into training camp. It sounds like they're nowhere close to an answer at this point in time. Lane, obviously there's a quarterback battle going on. Um, what are you looking for out of those guys? What what factors are you looking for the to determine who's going to start the Troy game? And uh, – how do both those guys, how can they benefit from this being such a, a competition? Well, I could have predicted the first question, <laughs> quarterback battle. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're looking for the guy that, you know, leads the team and moves the team the best. And 
you know, the intangibles within that are timing, accuracy, and decision making. Um, but you know, that's why we also chart things, you know, by production, um, by series. Once we get into scrimmages, you know, the guy has this many series, and this is how many points his team scores. So, because that's the bottom line: taking care of the ball and scoring. So I think that competition is great for anybody, um, especially both of them being young. So I do think that makes you better, no matter how old you are. It's good to have around. Um, so, and guys got to play really good around whoever it is because you're replacing a veteran quarterback that played extremely well and at times put the offense, especially with injuries, on his shoulders and took it to took it himself to win the game. So. Um, that's not one of these guys isn't going to feel that exactly yet, so it's going to take other people around to help that. Yeah, um, any time in these you'd like to have it sooner than later, but you know, it's like everything we do here, we deal in analytics. The more information you have, the better you make a decision. So, you know, we can't rush that. I think. One time for sure, I can remember where we've done that and made the wrong decision because we didn't have enough information. And so, however long that takes, ideally, have never liked that to go into a season, but you know, would never rule that out. But that would not be ideal. And you want to talk about some hype here? It's pretty wild. Lane Kiff has asked, you know, what's the next step? Even though he lost all three coordinators, several other assistants, almost a complete turnover of the roster here, yet after winning 10 games, what's the goal this year? Win the West? I mean, we got to, I'm not saying they can't do it, but let's see this team hit the field first. The schedule, we all know, lines up very, very well for Ole Miss. They should be 6 0 right out the gate if they, they've got Kentucky mixed in there at home. A very, maybe 5 and 1 is what. Hell, I'm already on record. I've already said 6-0, and oh, but again, we'll have to reserve those kind of talks so we actually see this unit on the field. But there's a there's a good chance that Ole Miss comes out here red hot, carries over that momentum. But Lane Kiffin, again, he's kind of pumping the brakes on all that talk. He's a little concerned with the buy-in factor with all these transfers coming in. Now, Lane is a master of, of pumping the brakes in the offseason, and I always fall for it. So I'm, I'm not necessarily buying it this time around, but there is a lot of sense to what he's saying. Year two of a program with the vast majority of your players coming back, it's a lot easier to get them to buy in because they've seen it work doing what the coaches ask them to do. This year, completely new challenge with a new set of coaches and a new set of players. So that's something on Kiffin's mind, no doubt. Lane, after last season, 10 wins and whatnot, uh, is is the next step for, for this program uh, winning the division, getting to Atlanta, that sort of thing, is that a natural – growth and and is this team equipped for that kind of goal i don't think like that and that may be wrong um i think that each year is so new and especially nowadays with the turnover of your roster to think we left off here and now we're supposed to go to here you know this isn't the nfl where you got most of your roster returning the next year and take the next step um you know not just as our roster are different but the people that we play is different so I don't look at it that way. That's so far, and I'm not saying that's not achievable, but that's just so far from today. You know, we're in the day and trying to get guys better today and figure out, like they just pulled me from film right now, you know, how can we get players better today and we'll worry about that stuff down the road. And that's outcome-based and we're all process-based. You mentioned how you were able to get last year's team to buy in. So how do you get this year's team to buy in? Well, that's a lot more challenging because I feel like, you know, we didn't lose a lot of players from year one to year two, um, you know, that had really significant roles compared to now year two to year three. So I felt like we had two years with those guys. Um, most of those guys were now, if you look on paper, what should be, what you would probably look on paper and say, these are the significant players. A lot of those guys, a number of those guys um, are brand new. I mean, I look out sometimes like we're in seven on seven, and, you know, and I look over there and we actually play eight, you know, on defense because it's drop eight. 
and I'm looking in six of the eight people, you know, didn't sign here out of high school or transfers. So that's just a challenge that we're into, and we've got to make sure that we're looking at everything like we always do, including do we simplify our systems because so many people, you know, are new to make sure they're playing fast. So we, we have a lot of work to do schematically, but especially culture-wise to get those guys to understand this is how we do things. You know, it's like a blended family coming together that these kids have been parented somewhere else. Not that we're better, but we're different than what they're used to. So. And then one little thing here, this is uh, just for old cousin Shane. He's a big fan of that Juice Kiffin down there who's tearing up social media. If you missed it, Ole Miss, they're having a recruiting weekends. Bring the juice or something like it. It's based around the dog, which Kiffin got for his daughter. He says he didn't even want the damn dog. Now the, the dog's going to be featured on college game day, and they're using him, again, as a recruiting tool. His Twitter is on fire. Uh, <laughs> interesting comments here. Lane Kiffin's a wild guy, and these comments don't disappoint. When you got a dog, do you think it would become a recruiting tool? <clears throat> I think a lot of things um, – in my career maybe seem like they're planned how they come out or in my life and so this was not but it looks like pr pretty brilliant actually that you know the dog was a recruiting tool and college game day's already been here for a special on him that'll air later on and um you know has his twitter and juice fest and all this but that was not this was just my daughter wanting a dog so which i was i really didn't want so, but so what's, what what have you thought as as you have watched the evolution of Juice? Um, I actually, as you asked that, like, you know, things happen. You don't know why they happen in different things, and you probably wouldn't think Juice would make me look at coaching better. But you know, Wild Rose now today's the third day because <clears throat> I don't know how to train a dog, and I don't really do what they tell me to do. So. Juice is not really well behaved right now. So <clears throat> Wild Rose came and got him. Today's day three for like training camp. So he's on day three of training camp. They come get him in the morning, take him out. They give me a list of notes. Okay, this is what he does well. This is what we did today. They actually video the things. Um, and it, actually this morning, meeting with them about it, I, I was like, there's so much similarities here to buying in and bringing people into culture because as – you know, he's going to, okay, hey, we're bringing him in, and all of a sudden he's around these other dogs, and how well they're trained has a lot to do with the training to him and him not being distracted by all the other things. And I was like, you guys are going through the same thing we're going through. Like, you know, when you bring people in an organization, transfers in, like getting them to buy in, and here's the puppy that he's taking over there with these other dogs that have been trained the whole time, and Juice ain't listening to what he's supposed to be doing. So I kind of feel like that's some of our transfers right now. Yeah, I, I did not think that was going to happen. I think probably like the typical kid gets the puppy, loves the puppy nonstop, and then all of a sudden you're taking care of it. Well, that's what happened this summer. And now the juice isn't quite so cute. She doesn't want to take him anywhere anymore. So the dog actually sleeps with me now and kind of goes everywhere with me. So, But I, <laughs> all right, I think that's a point we need to cut this one off. Again, we got a number of other coaches to get to on the next episode, I'm going to try to get this one up on Friday sometime in the probably late afternoon if I can if I can time it out right. But we're going to get this thing out because there is so much content going around in the SEC uh, this weekend. There's not going to be any let up. So stay tuned to everything we're doing, the YouTube page, the Twitter page. Uh, Instagram is give all those a follow that SEC podcast on every single platform and don't forget you made it this far we're really putting in the work I hope you guys are paying attention give us a five star written review on the Apple podcast app and the Spotify app won't cost you a thing and if you do that we'll send you a beer koozie free of charge we've got all 14 SEC teams represented on the koozies just send those reviews on over to that sec podcast at gmail.com and we'll mail you that koozie free of charge but that is going to do it for this episode of the show we'll catch you on the next one